Yeah, I'm uh, Rayan Zafar, I'm from London, um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about alcohol use disorder therapeutics and how over the last hundred years we've developed a scientific rationale for the integration of psychoactive molecules into the treatment for people uh, with alcohol use disorder. So by just way of background, um, when we look at the leading causes of the burden of disease in populations, we see that alcohol is the leading cause of a burden of disease globally. So you can see right there, smoking and tobacco is quite high up, high blood pressure, high body mass and alcohol use, but we know the secondary implications of alcohol use actually contribute to these things and drug use is there at the bottom. Alcohol in the UK at least is the leading cause of death in men under the age of 60 and soon women are going to catch up with that as women have developed more economic prowess and are drinking more and actually can't metabolize alcohol as readily as men. And so soon alcohol will also be the leading cause of death in women under 50 as well. Um, and you can see over there that about 5% of the global burden of all diseases in the world are due to this uh, molecule that is readily available uh, throughout society. So um, around 10 years ago, um, my boss David Nutt and a group of people um, at this charity called Drug Science wanted to understand in a scientific way the different merits of the drugs that we use both that are illegal and legal and try to put them into a criteria based on harms uh, to users and harms to self. And essentially this is what they came out with which I think has become a bit of a meme. Um, I know Elon Musk actually retweeted this and shows his friends on yachts, apparently. But what, he, what we found, so 30 experts around the world, was that alcohol is by far the most harmful drug to society, um, followed by heroin and crack cocaine. And then at the bottom of the graph over here, you can see drugs like ecstasy, LSD, magic mushrooms, and ketamine. So when we actually compare the harms of the drugs in society, it's the legal drugs, you can see tobacco quite high up there, and alcohol, which we as experts and scientists and clinicians deem to be the most harmful drugs. Now, the way that we split up this criteria is looking at harm to users, which is related to mortality, toxicology, morbidity, and harm to society. So we know alcohol is you know, very detrimental to society, inflicts huge economic burden, public health related issues, crime, domestic violence. Um, and you can see, you know, there are certain drugs like heroin and crack cocaine, which cause greater harm to users. Uh, but alcohol is not really too far behind. But because alcohol is so prevalent and widely used, that's the reason why it's been weighted as one of the most harmful drugs. And so therefore, it actually should be the greatest topic of drug policy and public health that we see. So when we look at the brains of people with alcohol use disorder, they don't look too different from the brains of people with dementia for, um, or different kinds of strokes. So you can see over here, this is the gray, gray matter and white matter tissues. And, that's healthy brain, but in alcohol use disorder, you see a lot of fluid on the brain. And actually, there's not a single drug which causes more neurotoxicity than alcohol. Alcohol is the leading cause of neurotoxicity in the brain. Um, and by, by standards in the EU, so food toxicology standards, a safe amount of wine to drink per year is a third of a glass. One third of a glass of wine a year based on current toxicology standards is considered safe. So if alcohol was found tomorrow, it wouldn't be a Schedule 1 drug, it would be in the league of its own, just based on uh, its harms. So it's not just us in the UK that are saying that alcohol is one of the most dangerous drugs to society, and drugs like psychedelics and MDMA are not so dangerous. So um, our study was replicated in the EU, and Australia, and also some US experts too. And since the banning of drugs, which was catalyzed in America over 50 years ago, um, we have seen a rise in the amount of deaths attributable to alcohol use disorder and substance use disorders. And they generally tend to be with substances which are at the higher end. So it's heroin, it's crack cocaine. But the second sort of part of my talk and what I'm going to go into is how drugs at the bottom of this kind of graph 
can help people who have been abusing drugs at the top part of the graph and how it's these illegal drugs or so-called illegal drugs that may be catalyzing a revolution in the treatment um, for alcohol addiction. And the reason why this is so important and the reason why we need to innovate treatment in this space is because addictions have the highest treatment gap of all psychiatric disorders. And by treatment gap, it means that individuals are not accessing or responding to treatment. So we know that about 20% of people currently respond to the three licensed pharmacotherapies for alcohol use disorder. Uh, so that means 80% of people relapse. And this is not just for alcohol use disorder. This goes across the board for heroin addiction, for other sorts of addiction. Um, and you can see over here, um, yeah, 92% of participants, even in the US, are not accessing treatment. So we know there's about 14,500 clinics specifically related to alcohol addiction treatment in the US. But that only serves about, I think it's about 15% of the population. And so we really need to start thinking as scientists, as doctors, as healthcare providers, how we can innovate new treatments and new treatment paradigms uh, to reduce this burden. So where do we start? I guess we can go back to the past and actually go back uh, to this guy who some of you may know, some of you may not. This guy's Bill Wilson, um, and he was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is uh, the largest sort of embodied society to help individuals who are dealing uh, with alcohol addiction. And he wrote this book called Distilled Spirits, where he reflected on his life as an alcoholic. So in 1934, he was admitted to New York State Hospital, where he took a treatment uh, which contained a variety of different alkaloids and plants, including belladonna and henbane. So these aren't classic psychedelics, they're called delirians, but what they induce is this profound state of altered consciousness. And it was during this experience that Bill Wilson realized he had a break for the first time in his life from craving, from cyclical thoughts about needing to consume alcohol, thinking about the withdrawal that was leading to the emotional and negative feedback. And he realized that having this profound change of consciousness that stopped the ruminative thoughts about addiction was actually profound. And he then went on to convince the NIH in the US to fund trials with LSD. So there were six trials done in the 50s and 60s, um, which are shown over here and over 500 patients given a high dose of LSD. Um, so this is a single dose of LSD, 250 got placebo, 250 um, got the LSD treatment, and you can see the effect size there says two. So that means you're two times more likely to have a reduction in heavy drinking days if you were given LSD than if you were in the placebo group. And we can break down some of the figures in a little bit more detail here. So in the LSD group, 60% of people improved, whereas in the placebo group, that's about 38%. And in medical statistics, we use this thing called the number needed to treat to understand how well an intervention is actually being taken up um, clinically. And so currently, pharmacological treatments for alcohol use disorder, the two drugs, so one is naumaphene and the other is acamprosate, and the number needed to treat for those are 20 and 12. So 20 patients for one to recover. So that's pretty awful, right? You're giving 20 people therapy and only one person recovers. But for LSD, the number needed to treat is six. So that shows that LSD is two to three times more clinically effective based on that data than currently licensed pharmacological treatments. Um, if we look at the effects of LSD on alcohol misuse in the short and medium term, you can see after a single dose of LSD, people were remaining um, in reductions in alcohol misuse up to six months, and then abstinence after one high dose, it was up to three months. So these, this is powerful. This is one treatment lasting 12 hours. And to patients who have been addicted to alcohol for 20 years of their life, and yeah, so... That was kind of the, the kind of early wave of research. Um, and luckily now, in the last decade or so, we've seen something which um, anthropologists call psychedelic renaissance, catalyzed by different universities across the world, and including Imperial College and different ones in the US now. 
Um, and now um, medical science has evolved. And some of the trials that were done in the 60s, they weren't at the same level in terms of rigor as we now have. And so we're now trying to put it through these kinds of clinical testings, working with biotechnology companies and pharma, uh, with the end goal of getting FDA approval in the US or in the UK and EU, we have different regulators, but essentially getting these drugs into markets where they're insurable and where psychiatrists can prescribe them safely to patients. Um, and in, uh, at New York State University, uh, in 2015, the world's first modern-day clinical trial um, was conducted uh, for psilocybin for alcoholism. Um, so two doses of psilocybin, 25 milligrams, which is a high dose, were given four weeks apart. And what you can see here is this is an open-label trial, so we only look at scores before and after. But you can see in both, in both these measures of drinking days and heavy drinking days, participants went from around... 45% drinking days to about 10% within the space of four weeks. And this seemed to persist up to um, 25 to 36 weeks, so six months after. Um, interestingly, when you break down some of these stats, it looks like a lot of numbers, but that PAC score right there is a craving score. And you can see the numbers quite clearly. At baseline, you have a craving score of 16 out of 20. But when you look at week 36, it goes down to 8 out of 20. So craving, which is a key biological marker of relapse, has actually halved after two six-hour trip sessions. But as scientists, we're really interested in why this is happening. So we know that craving is reduced. We know that people have long-term clinical outcome. But we want to get under the hood as to why this is the case. And so what we do is different things. We can do... Uh, something called the mystical experience questionnaire, where we ask people about their experiences under a trip. We ask them questions about experience of oneness, limitations between themselves and their ego, feelings of peace and tranquility. And we get them to basically measure this, and we give them an overall score. And interestingly, what they saw in this study was that the change in your drinking days, you had a greater change in your heavy drinking days if you had a greater mystical experience in the trip. So the more you trip, the less you drink in the long term. So that embodies the, the fact that the very nature of the psychedelic experience itself is powerful to treatment outcome. Those that you know, surrender, release, and embody the highest state really have the best outcomes. You can see minus 60% change in drinking days for people who score the highest on the MEQ. And for those that didn't, there's you know, less. So this is a very, you know, our values of 0.8 are pretty high. That's basically nearly almost affirmative. Um, and this is in a small sample, but now there's now data in larger samples as phase two clinical trial, which is one step along the roadmap towards regulation. And this is um, out of New York University again. Um, no? Sorry. Um, and in this study, what they found was that psilocybin was two times more effective than placebo in reducing heavy drinking days. So you can see again, similar to the first study, you have these persistent effects after just two doses, and there is a separation between placebo and uh, the, the treatment effect. Now, it's not just psilocybin or your classic psychedelics that seem to be effective. We're now seeing that drugs like ketamine, for example, uh, which has been pioneered by uh, a company called Awaken, based in the UK, um, who run this phase two study. And essentially, they found that ketamine plus psychotherapy, uh, which we can see over here, you have an 86% um, mean days abstinence. But when you compare it to the placebo and psychoeducation group, it's about 70%. So, Although that number doesn't seem too big, that 15% gap is still significantly different. Um, and when you compare the amount of uh, individuals that don't respond, as I mentioned, to other clinical trials, this is by far the most currently available and legal, legally advanced intervention uh, for psychedelic therapy currently. So now we went on to MDMA. So I was talking about psilocybin, ketamine, but now we also did some research um, looking at how MDMA might be effective in people with um, an alcohol addiction. Um, so I guess the difference between US trials and UK trials 
is that in the UK, when we onboard people for um, addiction, alcohol addiction trials, our patient population is a lot more severe. So um, in our study, these patients are taking about 130 units of alcohol a week. So that's the equivalent to about 15 bottles of wine or about five liters of vodka a week. Um, and we saw in this study, so we had to detox them before joining the trial. That's just part of um, how we do these studies. And they were given three doses of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, very similar to the MAPS protocol, uh, with some motivational enhancement therapy. And you can see actually nine months post-detox after three MDMA sessions, the long-term outcome is they go from 130 units of alcohol a week to 18.7. So that is a significant decrease. That's almost an 8 to 10x decrease in the amount of heavy drinking days. Now, many people get worried about MDMA. They talk about the effects related to a reduction in mood, a come down, Blue Tuesdays. Um, and we wanted to measure those. We wanted to make sure that these patients were not becoming depressed or having a lower mood after taking MDMA. Um, and I think this is quite important uh, to state. So basically, this graph demonstrates that after MDMA, so the lower the score, so the more that the, the kind of graph goes that way, it means that you have a worse mood. And the lower it goes, it means you have a better mood. And you can see, actually, between days one and days three, there is an increase in mood after taking MDMA. Nobody's getting more depressed. They're actually becoming happier. And maybe this is an afterglow. I think that's very much related to how we think about set and setting related to drugs. So come downs occur if you go raving and you, know, you funk your circadian rhythm, you're sweating in a nightclub, you're also using other drugs like alcohol on top. That is probably more related to the come down than MDMA taken at 9 a.m. in a clinical setting where the patients are discharged, they go home, they have a meal and a good sleep. So it's actually the context in which a drug is taken rather than the pharmacology of the drug that drives the come down effects that we, we see in society. But this nuances the difference between clinical MDMA and recreational MDMA. I think it's quite important to highlight that this is not just you know, dosing someone up. There's a very important psychotherapeutic element to MDMA therapy, which is an active trauma-based uh, therapeutic engagement. That's quite different to psilocybin, by the way, I just uh, posit, because psilocybin is more of an internal journey where the therapeutic aspects come before and after, but not actually during the acute experience too much. Um, and then when we look at these long-term outcomes and we compared it uh, to outpatient groups based in Bristol, um, based on the treatments that were given in this outpatient group, 75% of people were consuming more than 14 units of alcohol a week based on current treatments, which again shows the inefficacy of current treatment models, versus only 21% in the MDMA group. So you can see that long-term outcomes after nine months really significantly favor um, this group. Um, so for the last five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna focus on where we go from now and the work that I'm involved in at Imperial and others around the world to really start understanding how experimental medicine and modern scientific tools can optimize the development of these compounds such that we can actually become more precise in the way that we give it to patients. So um, our, work, our group at Imperial have pioneered neuroimaging in psychedelics, and we've unraveled some biomarkers and mechanisms of how psychedelics work in the brain. And so what we see acutely when we give psychedelics to individuals is that it disrupts this uh, layer five pyramidal cells which are in our cortex of the brain. The layer five pyramidal cells are involved in integrating information across the brain to allow for day-to-day -day thoughts and reasoning to happen. Unfortunately, in medical diseases and disorders, the way that those layer five pyramidal cells interact with each other holds on to cyclical ruminative thoughts that may be involved in depression. So by exciting these pyramidal cells, we essentially engage a brain in entropy, so we break down and shut off the way that that brain is connected. And the result of that is that the brain goes from a kind of very desegregated state to a hyperplastic state. So it essentially breaks down the neural pathways that maintain addiction-related thoughts. That's during the session itself. So that is the acute effects of psilocybin in the brain. Um, and just to show that in the red over here, 
This is where we have the highest expression of uh, uh, serotonin 2A receptor density. And that's where uh, classic psychedelics like, uh, like psilocybin and LSD seem to work. And they're most predominantly expressed in the neocortex, which is the most evolved part of the mammalian brain, and in fact, the most evolved tissue that society and humankind has ever known. It's the tissue and part of the brain that allows humans, the only um, thing in the world, apart from maybe AI at some point soon, um, has the ability to introspect. So it's these bits in red here. And the fact that it catalyzes and shunts the breakdown of thoughts in those areas leads to several things. It leads to neuroplasticity, which is the growth of new neurons in the brain. So from freeing your brain up from its thoughts and its cycles, it promotes the growth of new, new projections. Um, this is very much involved in brain development, and it's a process which underwires learning. And a lot of addiction, a lot of uh, mental health disorders are a product of aberrant learning. You've learned something wrong, you've learned bad habits. And so by catalyzing neuroplasticity, what you're allowing your brain to do is to unlearn bad habits and learn better ones. So during that acute state, your brain is put into a hyperflexible state where you can retrain yourself with psychodynamic therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, how to change your thinking around your drinking behaviors. And this is a neurobiology that underpins that change. We use different kinds of other techniques as well, like um, electrophysiological activity and PET neuroimaging to reconsolidate these ideas. And what we're beginning to see is that this neurobiology underpins four key domains, and that is connectedness and acceptance tends to increase. We have a decrease in negative cognitive biases, so we're not negative about ourselves. Our rumination and thought suppression, which was a paper that Tommaso was involved in at the front, uh, that tends to decrease after psilocybin, and trait openness, which is being more open. And these four facets are pretty critical to developing out of addiction, but also out of loads of mental health disorders. Um, and then the way that we structure our world, our inside voices, the way that we frame the narratives in our life tend to dramatically change. And this is just an example of how you know, our brains play tricks on us as we uh, start to believe things over time. And this concave mass, you don't know whether it's out-facing or in-facing, but you learn to see it in one specific way. But that's how the brain becomes tricked by addiction as well. You, send, you tend to see your addiction in one specific light. But by taking psychedelics, you can start breaking down these schemas that have developed over time and start seeing things in a new way, which is why Aldous Huxley talks about the, the doors of perception being cleansed. You're looking at life through a new lens again. And so the key question that we want to answer now, and that has never been done in any psychedelic addiction study, is we know that reward processing, so how individuals respond to reward is critical to how addiction liability um, uh, entails. And we want to know whether psychedelics can restore dysfunctional reward processing, and we then want to use that to understand how we can use that to optimize therapeutic development. And so using neuroimaging, we'll be able to see whether at baseline, so this is a schematic which shows how addiction is a bit more of a contracted neural state. When we look at the brains of people with addiction, uh, they generally don't seem to have engagement between different brain areas related to reward and cognition. It's very segregated, and they're very focused just on the object that they're addicted to. And what we think is that in a clinical setting with psilocybin, we push this open. As I mentioned, that neuroplasticity window opens. But what we think we'll be able to model in the brain is that there's a long-term carryover effect in these neural networks. And essentially, the key questions is, is it these neural pathways that change that might be the key to curing addiction? Is this the biomarker? Is it this shunting of the salience network, the default mode network? And is it this change in the neural signatures in these individuals that might help individuals re-engage with the world that they live in, may open up those doors of consciousness and help to reintegrate someone into society? So these are the burning questions, and I guess in about a year or two, um, we'll have some answers, as we're now currently uh, doing a few trials, uh, which I'm now heading up, so psilocybin for gambling addiction, 
uh, and suicide for heroin addiction, and there's groups around the world that are also doing it in alcohol use disorder. Um, and we're really keen to now, in the next part of experimental medicine, is to use precision neuroimaging techniques to enable better stratification of treatments to patients. Because I do want to say that, although I've spoken a lot about the benefits of psychedelics, in some of these studies, you know, 40% of people still don't respond. There's still a majority of people that do, they do respond, but there's still a significant, you know, minority that don't. And we want to know why that is. And perhaps neuroimaging and these tools will allow us to start stratifying those patient groups and understanding how we can actually make psychedelics uh, as accessible, available, and beneficial to the, the widest proportion of society. Um, so yeah, we want people to reconnect, recalibrate, and maybe even rebroaden reward. So in summary, it's not a magic bullet, but understanding treatment response through multimodal bio and psychological profiling will help us to develop predictive, pre preventative, personalized, and participatory science. Um, new receptor systems will be found, and having an understanding of these novel biomarkers will be able to get better ideas related to drug efficacy and targets. And translational neuropsychopharmacology, which is the research which sparked modern-day psychedelic research, um, using these same tools will be able to develop a better understanding of the pathobiology of addiction and therefore develop better treatments in the future. And the reason why this is most important, as I said at the start, is because in addiction we have the highest level of treatment gap of all psychiatric disorders. These patients aren't being treated and it's just getting worse. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone at Imperial, specifically Professor David Nutt, Dr. David Rizzo, Professor Robin Cart Harris and Matt Wall, and the rest amazing team um, who's here today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have time for a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's about letting go of the addiction or letting go of the processes and schematic thoughts that underlie cyclical. So in addiction, it's binge, intoxication, withdrawal, craving. That's the cycle of addiction. And that's a constant, repetitive cycle that addicts find themselves living in constantly. Psychedelics provide a six to 12 hour window in which you actually break down that cycle if you fully submerge into a psychedelic experience, you're actually no longer in that psychological state. And so what that embodies is that breaking free. And so the people that break free the most and allow themselves the greatest time away from that addiction can use that hyperplastic state to start questioning their cycle thoughts, questioning their triggers as they internalize the trip. So I think it's about that kind of stopping the cycle of um, repetitive cycle of decline. Um, that seems to be kind of underwiring it. And that is linked to Rebus. So Rebus is about kind of relaxed beliefs and the psychedelics. But what uh, we're trying to work on is a new model called RESERP, which is called rebroadening of salience and the psychedelics. So it's about relaxing your beliefs, but rebroadening your networks related to salience. So salience means what you like, what's important for you. And I think for addiction, it's more about understanding what's good for you Whereas in depression, it's about understanding what's bad for you. So it's slightly different and more nuanced when you compare uh, the different pathologies. Uh, yeah, I can take one more. Yeah, so um, in uh, the Bogan Sheet study, um, when you look at actually the kind of end. Uh, result uh, in the psilocybin group, treatment responders, treatment non-responders, 40% of the psilocybin group didn't have long-term benefit, whereas 60% did. So when you look at those mean figures over time, that's not broken down by people that respond and don't respond. Um, and we don't know why that is yet. Um, you can do subgroup analysis, um, but you need large sample sizes to really detect significance. But I think a good start is actually doing some biomarker analysis. 
um, because I think that will give us a bit of a clue into perhaps kind of the mechanism, because we just don't know how these things work. And I think understanding how it works is essential to understanding how we can then optimize treatments for the ones that it doesn't work for. Is it related to too low a dose? Is it related to they have a certain brain phenotype which is not responsive? Do they have immune markers which may be resistant to psilocybin or then not metabolizing psilocybin in the same way? Like we just really don't know uh, the nuance there. So uh, yeah, I think as I mentioned, it is still very promising these treatments are, but they won't work for everyone and it isn't a silver bullet. And so it's our duty as scientists to kind of innovate and think forward as to those patients that are non-psychedelic responders. Because for them, the outcome is pretty terrible. I mean, we live in a society where we're saying psychedelics are the best and the only thing. And you've got to think about the patients that that doesn't work for, because then what really do they have? So yeah, we're trying to think ahead of the game. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very on fire, everybody.